Hi, and welcome to yet another session of Study Chess with me. Uh, this will be on the middle game, studying Ludwig Pachmann's multi-volume work, uh, The Complete Chess Strategy. We are in the second volume on pawn play. And this is the chapter on the special cases of past pawns. Uh, the game here is Gligorich versus Sanchez, and it was played in the interzonal of 1952, round 21. They had big long tournaments then. And I've skipped ahead in the opening. Uh, we reached this position here. And Sanchez, who's playing the legendary Gligorich, um, played e5. But Bachman um, says that after e takes d5 in this position, bishop takes d5, bishop b7, c4, why would still have the better um, options here? So, okay, so he doesn't play this. And he says that after e5, we have a typical position in which the player with the passed pawn, Gligorich, uh, has an advantageous position. Okay. Knight e1, exclamation point. And he comments here, hold on, a very important move, making it impossible for black to blockade the d-pawn with his knight. Since now, if knight f6, f4, intending, so knight f6 intending knight e8 uh, and d6, just to be clear. So the idea would be here. And of course, prime square for the blockading knight. Um, f4. And here, unfortunately, there would have the following possibilities. So if he were to play e takes f4, question mark, a mistake, then e5, of course, is crushing. Um, if he were to play instead knight e8, following up on his plan, then f takes e5, queen takes e5, knight f3 attacking the queen, queen takes c3, bishop b2. Oh dear. Now the queen isn't necessarily lost, but once she goes to b4 or a5, needless to say, the queen is completely out of play and it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be a route here for, uh, for the white pieces against that poor king, not to mention the center. So yeah. Okay, fair enough. And if bishop d6, then knight f3, bishop g4, f5. Oh. With an advantage, with an advantage. I'm always hesitant about playing these kind of blockading moves because we don't really have a pawn roller in place for this. I mean, it can happen, but it's not there yet. And you have, sort of wonder if uh, how easy it is going to be to uh, exploit this. But okay, he's the grandmaster, and um, I can't claim to know better than him in this case either. Or in any case, but even here, I mean, middle game theory has evolved somewhat thanks to computers. Okay, fair enough. So bishop d6 instead. And knight c2. I'm guessing he's planning knight e3. Bishop d3. Okay. Knight f8. Knight f8. Well, I'm going to... Well, I mean, obviously, it's to be able to clear up the bishop as well, maybe bishop d7, but I'm going to assume that... Uh, well, yeah, he has to get that bishop out of there. Well, if the knight is not able to uh, go to d6, then it's going to go to g6 and f4, I'm guessing. Okay. Knight 3, knight g6. g3. And... He says, this is not only a defense against knight f4, okay, 
fair enough. But it is also a preparation for the important strategic advance of F4. Now, obviously, we can't play it immediately, but that's what preparation means. <laughs> So yeah, so if he's going to prepare f4, I was when I when he played knight e3, I kind of pictured him trying to go for f5, um, and maybe it has a dual purpose in this particular case. I'm going to say I'm going to assume then that he has now the alternate plan of playing knight g2 to help support f4 with multiple pieces and even a possible rook f1. Nice. I love these moves, and I'm speculating here because it's not written in the text, and I don't have Glingerich to tell me what he was planning. But, um, yeah, I love these moves which have like these multiple purposes. It just shows how uh, not how not only how flexible Glingerich is, obviously, but um, which goes without saying, uh, but the ability to allow multiple plans in play in case one of them doesn't really work pan out. Of course, you don't always have that option of making a move that has multiple plans, but <laughs> nice, nice. Okay. And he cannot play the natural bishop d7, obviously, because a6 is in kind of a need of preparation. So, for example, bishop d7, and yeah, a6 is kind of hanging, so... Oops. Fair enough. And he points out that a5 is undesirable. Yeah, I would never have thought of playing a5 with black here, honestly. I mean, if you play a5, then you just killed all your chances of any kind of counterplay on the queen side. And then you're just going to be stuck waiting for things to happen on the king side because... Well, yeah. Okay. Well, he does add it, so. So, bishop b7, knight c4, exclamation point. Wow. So, not knight g2. Oh, I see. It's f4 with the idea of e5. I mean, obviously, but in this case, it's probably preparing some kind of tactical um, follow-up. Maybe take on d6. Yeah, that'd be nasty. Hmm. Okay. And he's actually threatening. It doesn't seem like it at first, because you're kind of distracted looking at the center, at least I was. Um, he's actually threatening b6. I mean, now, obviously not immediately, but after rook b1... How do you defend b6? If you advance it, the pawn's lost. And yeah. There's no piece to come to its help, to, to come to its uh, rescue. So what does he say here? Oh, he has a comment. A well-known strategic motive. Uh, White threatens to eliminate the blockader whilst gaining a tempo with his secondary threat of rook b1 winning a pawn. Okay. Nice. Okay. So rook eb8 and bishop e3 question mark by Pachman. And he says this is an inexactitude. That's the translation. Uh, giving black the chance to play bishop f8. which would then threaten b5. Okay. Uh, white should take the bishop immediately, and black also does not, unfortunately, because he didn't uh, uh, play the right follow-up move, does not appreciate the value of this uh, d6 piece and neglects the opportunity to keep it. So instead, he played... Instead of playing bishop f8, he played bishop, oops, sorry, bishop c8. And that, of course, gets a deserving question mark, since he should have taken on d6. Okay. 
Knight takes d6, queen takes d6, f3, h5, queen f2, exclamation point by Pachman. And he comments, an excellent move preparing f4. Sorry, it's because the text, and I've probably mentioned this already in the past, is all in descriptive notation. And while I can read descriptive notation, I don't think in descriptive notation. So I have to kind of translate it in my mind when I read it out to you. Uh, it actually was written capital P dash K B four, which means pawn to king's bishop's fourth, or in shorthand, F four. So anyway, uh, an excellent move, preparing F4 and at the same time forcing black to block the queen side in view of the powerful threat of A5, of course, which would target this pawn. Because now, of course, the threat is A5 undermining the b6 pawn and then of course uh, by extension c5 and with this battery here c5 is in trouble in any case that's the threat it's not happening just yet so and as a result he forces black's hand and black instead plays a5 himself and we've Hockman and Gligorich is not one to waste time. And now he, he plays his much desired f4. Exclamation point. This begins the second part of White's plan, operations on the king side. He now threatens f... Sorry. He now threatens... I've got to add this move here. f5, knight f8... Bishop e2, attacking h5, g6, f takes g6, f takes g6, rook f1. And after rook a7, queen f6, and yeah, we're starting to really get into that position. Of course, black's very cramped position now um, is giving him a lot of trouble because it's very difficult to be able to move your pieces around into the right squares. So never forget space. So e takes f4, g takes f4, bishop g4, rook d2, queen d7, bishop f1. Huh. Why not e5? You have something to say about it? Okay, so he does. Uh, so he says yes. He could also play e5, but he does not want to give his opponent the slightest counter chance with knight e7 f5. Okay, so. E5 is playable, and I still wonder whether this isn't even just stronger. No engines, no engines. Now, obviously, the D5 pawn is not hanging. I'll just point out the obvious. After queen takes, bishop takes G6, discovered attack, and thank you for the piece. So, yeah. Um, and you're still threatening, of course, C4. to bolster c5, uh, d5, or even bishop e4. But he's saying that he doesn't want to give him any counter chances with the idea of knight e7 and knight f5. Fair enough, fair enough. So 
So bishop h3. Bishop takes h3, queen takes h3, queen g3. And this is the 29th move. And this is gets the Zervings an, uh, an exclamation point by Pachman. And he says that after queen takes g3, hence the strength of, queen, of g3, h takes g3, followed by f4, sorry, c4, uh, followed by c4 and rook b1, white wins easily. Even now he would have the superior ending after What? Oh, after the text move, sorry. So even after queen h4, which is what was played, he would have the superior ending after queen takes queen, knight takes, obviously threatening knight f3 check, king f2, rook e8, e5. Kind of looks like that so-called no counterplay position with the knight on f5, but in this case with fewer pieces. But okay, he does say superior ending, doesn't say winning. But it does make you question whether he was right about the whole, you know, not allowing, not playing e5 instead in the first place with the pieces on and just create this humongous center there with d5, e5, supported by c4 and f4. It just looks brutal and then you can just bring start up operations on the king side because that center of yours is just going to force black to constantly keep on the lookout for it well doesn't matter so bishop f2 queen f6 and Bachman kind of analyzes this game very deeply as we pointed out. Remember, these guys didn't have computers. And yeah, I, unless Gligorich had already analyzed and published his analysis somewhere, I'm unaware of it, but it's possible. Then, yeah, he had to analyze this pretty much on his own. So he points out now that after... Queen takes f4 would be a mistake because of queen takes, knight takes, bishop g3, g5, okay. Bishop takes f4, g takes f4, c4 is just really, really bad for black. In fact, it's a one rook ending for white. And yeah, that's pretty easy to see. I mean, it's black's pieces, black's position is not tatters. He's got the big center. He's got the uh, black has that weak b6 pawn. Uh, f4 is going to fall. You got those isolated pawns on f and h. Yeah. Doesn't need a lot to convince me there. Okay. So queen f6, f5. Wow. It's not the first move that came to mind. Why doesn't he transpose? I mean, or try to transpose if it's such a big thing. I'm just trying to understand. I mean, we had that example of the winning rook ending, right? Doesn't it transpose if he plays e5 here? I mean, yeah, you lose the f4 pawn, but you lost it in the previous line too. And then you just sort of like built this crushing position. What would he do after, sorry, what would he do after e5? I mean, that's my question. If you take here, fine. Doesn't it kind of transpose to the previous line?
play g5? Okay. Unless you want to play knight g6, but I don't see much point in that. Because if you play knight g6, I'll just play h4. And so what? Yeah, 97, 95, okay, but still, you still have that huge center. I mean, it's the same idea. And you can play c4 and then attack those, uh, keep that uh, b6 pawn uh, under fire. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm tempted to ask the engine, but I really don't want to because the whole purpose of this, uh, uh, this study sessions with the book and whatever is to develop my own sense of positional play, understanding the ideas, the plans, even if it misses, let's say, an exact move, a subtlety or some kind of tactical follow-up, the concepts are still valid. And those are the ones that we're going to be applying. It's not as if uh, every time I apply that concept, it's going to be undone because of that same tactic or something. It isn't. So that's why I don't really worry too much about um, whether or not the engine is going to say, yeah, he had a more precise move here because he could play, you know, he missed this tactical shot. It's possible. And Pacman has made mistakes. I'm sure of it. But it doesn't change the value. It doesn't diminish the value of his lessons. But nor does that prevent us from asking questions ourselves and trying to analyze and, you know, develop that process. Just the light here. I have a feeling it's darkening here, and I have a feeling this thing's probably some create some glare on my face. Is what it is. Okay, so um Yeah, food for thought. Food for thought. It's not the end of the world. So he plays F five, which is really not the first move I would think of that comes to mind, honestly. So he's going to be forced to play, yeah, 95. I mean, what else, right? 95, king h1. And he has a comment, though, after f5. He says, so Gligorich selects this move rather than e5. He has the slow but sure plan. He doesn't propose the line, though. But sure plan in mind of exchanging the minor pieces on e5, then exploiting his protected, his protected past deep pawn in the major piece ending by building up an attack against black's b pawn and the black's b pawn is just for descriptive curiosity is written black's qnp queen's knight's pawn i wish they'd make a modern <laughs> Well, there actually is a modern uh, edition with algebraic, but just not in English. I actually own this book. I'm reading from a, um, a, a version I found in English so that I didn't have to translate it from French, but I have the French book. Um, and it's a very clean edition by um, the Edition Grasset, and um, it has algebraic notation. Okay, so... Fair enough. So he plays knight e5, king h1, rook e8, rook e2, knight g4, bishop g1, I thought he wanted to exchange it. Why not let him exchange it? Or is there something else he's planning with that bishop? No. Queen e5. Queen f3. Right. It's because he doesn't want to exchange necessarily the queen so much as get rid of the rook. All right. Queen f6. Rook f1. Rook ad8. H3. Be gone, sir knight. Queen h4. Since obviously h5 would be hanging. Bishop h2, exclamation point. Knight takes h2. Deserving a comment. And this is move 38. Sorry. Um, so knight f6 would be weaker. 
because of rook f e one threatening both bishop c seven yeah that's that's annoying. as well as queen g3. Force an exchange of the queens and ridding himself of all of those counterplay that uh, Black is still trying to drum up with those pieces of his. The only two pieces of his that are actually playing here. Okay. So knight takes h2, king takes h2, rook e5, rook g1, and this, of course, has the tactical um, threat of queen g3, after which he'll be forced to exchange. Pretty much. He'll play queen g3, is threatening mate on g7, attacking the rook and the queen. If you play queen f6, I can still play queen g5. I mean, assuming that my goal is to get rid of those queens and just leave it as a rook endgame. So... Rook g1, rook d7, and Pachman is quick to chastise him for this. He said, black could have made it a little harder for white if he had instead played king f8. And that would be, in his opinion, a, well, sure, bring the king into play. Okay. Fair enough. Oh, there is this other little trick. And that is that now queen g3 wouldn't be the same threat at all because you're not threatening mate anymore. And I could potentially, I don't know if the lines work, I could play rook takes e4. Um, maybe, though. I mean, the queen check might still be fatal. Yeah. Okay. So, rook d7. Not the best. Rook e g2, f6, rook e2. And Pachman points out, this rook maneuver has forced black to block in his queen, which can now be exchanged after due preparation. So, king h8 c4, king g8, rook g e1, king f8, king queen g3, yeah, now there's no choice, so queen takes g3, queen takes, doesn't it work? No, of course not. He's double play, prepared uh, e2, so yeah. Queen takes g3, queen and king takes g3, king e8, rook b1, attacking b6, rook b7, king f4, king d8. And Pachman points out here, now comes a characteristic maneuver in such positions. White sacrifices his queen pawn in order to win the b pawn and penetrate with his rooks into the enemy camp. D6, exclamation point, king D7, rook EB2, king C6, D7, yeah, has to be stopped. King takes, rook takes B6, rook C7, rook D1 check, king E8, rook D5, and black resigned. Since after... Rook four, rook e seven, more specifically. Rook check, king b f seven, rook d eight, black must lose material. 
impressive win by Gligorich. A great lesson by um, Ludwig Pachmann, the example of uh, the game and so forth. Okay, so now to move on to the next game, which will be between Wolfgang Unzicker and Niekirch. Be right with you. Unzicker is a very famous German player um, from the 50s and 60s. He didn't quite reach the levels of, let's say, a Robert Hubner, who was in the top three players in the world, as I recall. Um, but nevertheless, he was a top 20 player for much of his career. And in 1960, that was really, you know, one of his strongest times. According to Chess Metrics, and I'm going to show you here the rating that they calculated him as, uh, in 1960, which would be around the time this Olympiad game took place, he was considered to be the 17th player in the world per um, Jeff Sonis's calculations. In any case, here we have the game between uh, Unzikur and Irkish. Unzikur is playing the German with the German team against Bulgaria, and the game starts. E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight C6, Bishop E5. Okay, so we have a Roy Lopez, A6. This was before um, Kramnik ruined it for all of us with his insistence in playing the. Berlin defense and convinced everyone else to play it as well. Ouch. Anyway, bishop a4, d6, c3, and I say ruined it. I don't mean anything um, against uh, the great Vladimir because, hey, <laughs> if the open opening was there and ready to be exploited and everybody decided to use it as well, then that's saying a lot about the quality of his find and his analysis. Okay, so back to the game. Bishop d7, d4, knight f6. So this is pretty much main line here. Bishop e7, da, da. rook e1. Oh, rook e1. Not quite. Takes d4. Because usually we have a little h3 in here. Well, no, no h3 here. This is a different line. Fair enough. I haven't played the main rule unit myself in a long time. C takes, knight b4, bishop takes d7, queen takes, knight f1. So none of these moves have any commentary whatsoever by Pachman. So I'm just skipping right through, as should be. Okay, we're, we already have that passed pawn situation. Knight g3, and now we have a comment. Um, White has obtained a protected passed pawn from this opening variation, but it is unclear whether this constitutes an advantage. Black can blockade on d6 with a minor piece, whether d6 or the knight, um, and then utilize his queenside pawn majority. So, yeah, he has three pawns, as we can see on the queenside. And, of course, he can advance b5, and he'll be facing two, and therefore that will be the nature of his counterplay. And if he blockades the, uh, the d pawn with a piece here, then he'll have that much else going for him because White's, let's say, ace in his sleeve really isn't going to amount to much. Bishop to queen third. So bishop d6, and he says, this is a mistake. This unobtrusive move is a serious error. Okay. Black should postpone as long as possible the decision whether to blockade the d-pawn with his bishop or his knight. He has two stronger alternatives which keep his options open. So don't commit until you have to. Words from the wise. So instead of bishop d6, he points out, black could have played knight e8, which might seem to be committing, but it isn't necessarily. He still has, let's say, g6, f5, and he can still choose what he wants to do with that knight somewhere else. Um, f4, and if knight f5, he just points out, sorry, if knight f5, knight d6. Exchanging the knight and then leaving the bishop to play on d6. Or if knight takes on d e7, then the knight will be left on d6. Either way, he'll have a nice piece to place, and knight f5 won't have been an issue. Okay, good.
So, and the alternative other than knight e8 was simply c4. Uh huh. And c4, exclamation point. So, this is the move actually that he likes. And this bishop takes up an, an and now the bishop takes up an active position on c5 while the knight heads for d6. So bishop would come here, and the knight then on d6, and then we have a very desirable setup for our pieces. And it needs to be pointed out that c4 does have an extra advantage. Uh, it's, not, it's not in danger right now uh, in, by any means, because we always have b5 or rook c8, but it already pins, let's say, the white pawn uh, on b2 in a way that it won't be able to try to prevent um, black from doing anything immediately because white could try to play b3 himself, presumably. So we can now see um, that bishop d6 has cost black a valuable tempo. If the white rook were on a1. What? Oh, I skipped something. Sorry. My bad. So, knight f5, knight e8, bishop e3, rook c8, rook c1, c4. Okay, and now we have the right comment. Sorry. Uh, we can now see that bishop d6 has cost black a valuable tempo. If the white rook were on a1, okay, now that makes sense, um, black would have nothing to fear, whereas now white can clear up the situation on the queen side in an interesting way. And the interesting way here is b3, exclamation point. And he played bishop takes a3. But there's a good deal of analysis here on what the alternatives were. And uh, Grandmaster play, and obviously Unzikur probably spent a good, a good amount of time calculating all of these lines himself. So let's see what Pachman uh, is going to share with us. So first of all, he points out that c3 would be a mistake. Because of b4, exclamation point. When black's c pawn is lost, and a good example of the danger uh, in advancing a passed pawn without proper preparation. Also bad is b5, protecting the c4 pawn. Since after a4, oh, this is classic. The position, the, those pawns are just completely undermined here. After a4, when black remains with a weak pawn after pawn takes b3, rook takes c8, queen takes c8, queen takes b5, pawn takes b5, a takes b5, queen takes b3, and b5 is weak. Especially because the rook, which could theoretically just come up and help protect that b5 pawn, can't do that because the knight is on e8 and they won't be able to get there in time. The bishop on d6 is uh, doing some extra heavy lifting here. And we do have rook c1 hanging through. Okay. And he has one more line for us. He says that after c takes b3, fair enough, rook takes c8, queen takes c8, queen takes b3, White can render Black's queenside completely harmless with Rook C1 and A5 because B5 question mark would allow Rook C1 and Rook C6. So all in all, after this uh, plentiful analysis and very interesting. C4 
b3. Bishop takes a3, which is what was played. It doesn't necessarily mean that these are the this is the winning continuation, simply the lesser of the evils. Rook takes c4, knight d6. And Pachman is quick to point out that rook takes c4, in case you're wondering. B takes c4 is positionally bad because although black has an outside passed pawn, the A pawn notably, um, white can exert decisive pressure down the B file with queen B3, rook B1, and C5. So queen B3, rook C1, and C5 held by the bishop. And yeah, this uh, pawn is in big trouble. So knight d6, knight takes d6, bishop takes d6, queen c2, rook c e8. And he points out, yes, obviously rook takes c4 is still bad for black because of the reasons we just saw. So he has to give up the, the c file now or after rook e c1. So the rook isn't going to be able to stay there no matter what happens. There's no option. Either you exchange it and go into that dreadful position after b takes c4, or you just vacate the c file and yeah, try something else. So bishop c5. And this is deserving of an exclamation point. The keen reader who, remain, who remembers what we said about the good and bad bishops will wonder why white decides to exchange this active bishop for black's inactive bishop. Because it might be blockading the pawn on, uh, with the bishop on d6. It's not actually doing anything active to the position. It's just a really nice defender piece. Whereas the white bishop, as we can see, is a very strong piece. It's exerting uh, strong pressure on both sides and, of course, leaves other options open. So why would we do this? And the reason is the latter, is that the latter, the d6, is a very useful blockader, whereas after its exchange, the pawn must be blockaded uneconomically by the queen or rook. Aha. That's actually the lesson of the day, if you ask me. We're not so much worried about which of these bishops is stronger, so much as once the bishops are gone, the queen is going to have to start doing guard duty on d6 or a rook, and none of those pieces are a desirable place. The queen is a perfectly competent defender on d6 with long diagonals and so forth, but why on earth would you want to relegate your most powerful piece to just guard duty on d6? So, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So, bishop c5, f5. And he says the following. Hold on. The only way to obtain counterplay. Weakening his e-pawn, but the resulting, open, the resulting open file will make white's task more difficult. Yeah, you can't just sit around and wait for things to happen. You gotta try to make something happen and hope for the best. Which Sanchez is, no, Nikirk, sorry, um, is to his credit doing. So after, so he plays f3 and he points out that after the hasty e takes f5, then bishop takes c5, rook takes c5, queen takes f5, queen takes f5, rook takes f5, rook c7, Rook d8, rook d1, e4, d6, rook b5. Ah, yes. Black is hanging in there. Okay. Not brilliant, but yeah. By a thread, it has to be pointed out. 
I was trying to look at the consequences of an immediate D7, but black is in time. After D7, King F7, Rook C8, Rook E7, we're in time to cover our bases. So, yeah. Okay, good. So, F3. Patient and careful. F takes e4, f takes e4, rook f7, bishop takes d6. I mean, we want to exchange it, right? Queen takes d6, rook c8. Again, a purposeful exchange. As white needs a point of entry on the file, he controls. In general, when one has a permanent advantage, such as a protected passed pawn, there's no need to fear simplification. With this particular pawn structure, queen and rook versus queen and rook, uh, it is the most fa favorable material balance for this setup. You know, we have the advanced uh, uh, protected pass d pawn, and in as, as far as the pieces that are on the board are concerned, the best setup you can have hope for is queen and rook versus queen and rook. With minor pieces, it is much more difficult and usually even impossible to exploit such an advantage. So, rook ef8, rook takes, rook takes, queen c3 keeping pressure on e5 to not to let the queen out of there. Queen b6 check, king h1, queen f2, question mark. Obviously threatening mate, but obviously that's not going to be enough, so question mark. So he points out... Uh, Okay, so the threat of mate is tempting, but completely wrong from a strategic point of view. Black must patiently maintain the blockade of the d pawn, as active play only hastens his defeat. After <clears throat> queen d6 instead, white would probably continue with h3, h6, Rook c1, king h7. And he says that after rook f4, queen c8 check is very strong. He actually gives it as winning. Why? I mean, there's literally no analysis or conclusion here. It just puts queen c8 check end of the line as if this was the obvious refutation. I'm just not seeing it. Yeah, you can take on b7, but so what? e4 is hanging, and then I don't see what you're going to be getting. It's not crushing in any way. I, I'm not sure what Pachman saw. I mean, I can see some tactical ideas. I'll give you one, for example. If I were to play, uh, if let's just say I play king h7. I mean, that's the obvious continuation for black. Queen takes b7. 
I mean, I don't see what else he had in mind, honestly. You can try to play queen e6, but let's first finish this line. So queen takes b7, rook takes e4, okay? Rook c6. Now, there is a cute little tactic here, but black isn't forced to fall for it. You can, if you played queen takes d5, oh no! Then you have rook takes h6, king takes or queen takes doesn't matter, and you get the queen. Fine. But you're not forced to play this at all, and there's no immediate threat. Yes, the d-pawn is threatening to advance very fast, but you've got an exposed king here on h1, which is subject to all kinds of threats himself, as well as perpetuals. So, for example, uh, instead of taking d5, which would be a blunder, obviously, I could play... Heck, I could play rook f8? Rook queen f8, in fact. Queen f8, or even queen a3. I'm not sure which one is best. Well, I like queen a3 because it prevents the rook from coming back to c1, and that really poses a question. What's your idea? I mean, yeah, you could play whatever, this or even d6. Let's just play d6. That's, that's the whole idea after all. I have queen check, h2. I'm going to be threatening all kinds of little tr nasty tricks here. And yeah, it's, it's really not obvious to me. How does white get out of this? And that's just one line. If I were to play, I don't know, even queen f8 here, you got the same threats. Yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced, I'll be honest. I mean, if there's an obvious line that I'm completely missing here, so be it. But it's not that rich in tactics here, so I don't think I am. Unless the idea is something completely different. Okay, so we did mention queen e6. Fine. So queen a3. Rook, I don't know. Rook here, because I mean, you do have to protect e4. Queen before. Attacking the rook on e1. And of course, e4 twice. Yeah. This, this doesn't look right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I just don't see this whole queen c8 check thing as being this big crushing line here. I'm not saying white isn't winning here and uh, there's something wrong with his evaluation and Zunzinkur screwed up or something. Uh, it's just this particular line, the analysis that ends with queen c8 check, no comment. You can't play rook f4 because of that. I think you can play rook f4. All right, well, let's get back to the game. So queen f2, mistake in any case, h3, g5, rook c1, queen f4. Okay, well, it's not like you have a lot of options here anyway. So queen f4, what move is this? 33. So queen f4, d6, exclamation point, crushing. And he played g4 now. And he points out that queen takes e4, d7, queen e2, queen c4 is crushing. Yeah, no arguments there. Just to point out the obvious, if queen takes, rook takes, rook d8, 
rook c8 is winning. And it won't matter if you bring try to bring in the queen first, the king first. I'll just point this out. Even if you try to play king f7, rook c8 is still crushing. Because there's no way you can do both. So. Okay. And... So he says also, I'm sorry, not this, g4, rook d1, g3. And it says, of course, queen takes c4 is crushing. So g3, again, threatening mate. He still cannot capture the e-pawn. Because of d7, rook d8, queen c8. Yeah. OK, that's pretty simple. And he can't take on h3 because of queen takes h3, queen takes e4 d7, rook d8, queen e6 check. Yeah, that's game over. If king g7, queen e7, and of course, any other place, then uh, king f8, rook f1, and king h8, queen e8. So, well done. g3, queen d3, protecting against mate, rook d8, D7. Black's rook now blockades the pawn, but in a typically bad way, as it stands completely passive. White's queen only needs to reach e8 or c8, and the game is over. Queen g5, queen d5 check, king h8, queen f7, queen g6, protecting against e8. Queen e7, queen b6, rook c1, and black resigned. Fantastic. Okay, so that's going to wrap up my uh, session today of uh, Pacman and strategic play. Um, thank you for joining me. Happy chess and good mates.